If you have your scriptures, I, well, I think some of the pews have like a copy of the scriptures there on the little hymnal rack and stuff like that. You'd want to get your uh, copy of the scriptures and turn in the New Testament to the gospel according to Luke. Chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. It's going to be uh, start at verse 36. I want to put a finger there. It's going to go verse 36 to verse 50. You know, these little, little, little ones, they're just cute. That's all there is to it. So, <clears throat> we, um, on Wednesdays, we have brave souls that come and work with, and, and great hearted souls that come with, uh, work with kids, work with teens, work with everything in between. Um, We've been looking at, uh, on Wednesdays, just like we are here on Sundays, we've been looking at parables. And this past week, I sat right here. And we had, I don't know, Chris, what do you think, 20, 22, 23, something like that, a bunch. Middle school kids. And so we'd already been out playing Rabbit and the Hunter. (laughs) And then we brought everyone in here. And we had them all sit down, and they are incredible. Really, I think when it comes to the teaching time, they're incredible. So I, I sit here, and we kind of gather around, and I have them kind of find place either right here in the very front pews or here on the floor, and we sit and we talk. And I was talking to, the, to these kids, and I uh, mentioned to them, I said, you know what, we're going to be talking about a parable that Jesus told. And I said, who here knows what a parable is? And my eyes were opened at that because that I could see one one kid knew what a parable was and I thought well you know that tells me something and it made me very glad it made me very glad that we do something on Wednesdays that can not only reach kids but that can introduce kids to things that we take for granted that we shouldn't be taking for granted. So I explained to them that a parable is really a simple thing. It's simply a story that's told to make a particular point. Now here on Sundays, we've been talking about Christianity Illustrated. It's the same thing. It's a story that's told to, to drive home a particular point. That's what a parable is. And Jesus taught in parables, we know that, and, but what we don't always understand is that Jesus used parables, there's as many, almost as different ways that he uses parables, that's as varied as the parables. In Mark chapter 4, remember when he talks about the sower and the seed, the sower and the soils? He's teaching a large crowd, and so that's how he's trying to communicate with them. And I realize, you know what? No pun intended, but you can plant an idea through a parable that people will remember. So when we sat here, but anyhow, that's how Jesus would teach large groups. At the same time, he would also use parables to answer questions. Last week, I believe, we had folks who took time to share about the Good Samaritan. And that's what we were talking about with the middle schoolers this past Wednesday. And I said, do you understand something? Someone asked Jesus a question 2,000 years ago. And Jesus told this story to answer that question. And now 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. You think that's not a master teacher? So sometimes it's to teach the crowd. Sometimes it's to answer a question. But sometimes... Sometimes Jesus uses a parable. He uses a parable. You're going to watch this because I've got some hand motions with it. <laughs> he uses a parable to frame or reframe a situation. And in Luke chapter 7, what is not always readily apparent is that this is a situation and Jesus speaks the parable to kind of frame the situation. You with me? Hey, okay. Audience participation time. You with me? Okay. 
Luke chapter 7. Here's the situation. Starting in verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees. Pharisees were religious folks, but a lot of them were also pretty wealthy. So they were kind of influential. They were kind of what we would call elitist. Okay? So... One of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to come to eat with him. So Jesus entered the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. That's the way they'd eat. Sort of like guys watching football. They kind of lean out on the couch. That's kind of what happens here. Now, by the way, the Pharisee's name is Simon. So, okay, go on. Verse 37. Behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, we're not really told what kind of sinning she was doing. (laughs) We're just told that she was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was there at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind Jesus, being at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet from her tears. But she kept wiping them with her hair, then kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man, being Jesus, were really a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. That's the situation. Let's move on. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon replied, Say it. A certain money lender, as Jesus giving the parable, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Remember what denarii are? It's money and how much? Day's wage. One owes 50 days wages, one owes 500. They were unable to repay. So he, the money lender, graciously forgave them both. Which of them do you think will love him more? So Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. And Jesus said, you've judged correctly. And then turning toward the woman, Jesus says to Simon, Do you see this woman? It would be hard not to see her, but nonetheless. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. That's, that's a greeting. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loves much, but he is forgiven very little, loves very little. And he said, your sins are forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him, other guests, began to say to themselves, who is this man to even forgive sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, so go in peace. Keep that open. Now, let's take just a moment and we'll pray. And now, Father, I'm going to ask that you speak to us even as Jesus spoke, so we would hear and understand, and more than just understand, that we would be shaped. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ever have an aha moment where the light comes on, and what you thought you were seeing, you realize you weren't seeing clearly at all, but you see something in a very different light now? Ever have those moments where the dots get connected all of a sudden, and it's like, didn't see this. I remember years ago, we were going to take uh, kids to youth convention. And, uh, you know, the, all of the big controversy, whenever you took a lot of kids to youth convention, was who's going to be roomed with who? Because that began the whole pecking order and the whole social stratification of what's going on. Anyone work with youth, you know this to be true. Now, by and large, guys don't really care. So the truth is, it was all on the girls. <laughs> and so there was always anxious moments. And we had this deal, I'll never forget, we had this deal... 
and we had all the rooms assigned, and everyone seemed reasonably happy. And then there was a girl that couldn't make it, and all of a sudden, these other girls, there was supposed to be four to a room, and they came to me, and they said, well, we're really thinking, we'd really love, we've not gotten to know this girl over here very well, and we'd really like to get to know her better. So I'm wondering if maybe she could be in our room. And I thought, well, how gracious of these girls that they want to reach out and get to know this other girl that they hadn't really appeared to like all that much before, but they were wanting to welcome this girl into their room. And I was greatly heartened. And then I realized something. My aha moment. And that was I realized it had come down to this girl or another girl. And while the girls didn't really like this one girl, they disliked the other girl. And all of a sudden, all the flowery and wonderful things that they were saying kind of changed light a little bit. And their desire to reach out and to reach into this girl's life and befriend, I realized, I don't think they're really seeking to befriend this girl. They're seeking to avoid the other girl. And that was my aha moment, that what I had been seeing, I didn't really see at all cast and then the light was was kind of turned on and as the light would shine on that I saw the situation a whole lot more clearly. Let me tell you something about Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and what we've just read the situation is one I had not ever really seen very clearly before. I thought, okay, here's this lady that shows up. The reason the lady shows up is because when people would have a big dinner gathering, it was kind of like an open house. You know what I mean? And so you kind of give up the right You have some people that you invite, but there's also always the prospect that someone's just going to show up. And particularly if it was outside, then it's even easier for someone to show up. Okay, So that's kind of the backdrop to that. But the situation itself, what we don't always understand is this. This situation is a setup. And I never recognized that before. It's not a setup to try to trap Jesus into anything. You know what it's a setup for? It's a setup to dishonor or to embarrass or humiliate Jesus. Did you know that? The aha moment comes when you see what Jesus says to Simon. And when you understand basic hospitality etiquette in biblical times, you understand what's going on a whole lot more clearly now. Let me line out some things. Basic, basic etiquette of hospitality. Anytime you would welcome an honored guest, when they would come to your home, you would greet them with a kiss. We all see the Middle East kind of stuff, and we see them going the whole cheek-to-cheek thing. Usually it was kiss to hand, right? But this was a way simply to show honor that you, want, you are welcome here, and I will give you a kiss on the hand. That was basic But Jesus didn't receive that when he came to Simon's house. Did you pick that up? The other thing that would happen is there would be the thoughtfulness to say, you're walking in sandals and you're here in dirt roads. Your feet are nasty and we're here to eat. So guess what? We will provide you water so you can do what? Wash your feet. Fundamental, basic etiquette. But it isn't offered to Jesus. The third thing that would happen is, because they're outside a lot and because it's the Middle East, they would need sometimes to be refreshed when a guest came. And an honored guest would be given oil to put on their face and to put in their hair so that they could be soothed from the elements. This is basic stuff. But it isn't offered to Jesus. What's more, not only is it not offered to Jesus, it is not offered to him in the presence of everybody else at the dinner. This is a setup to humiliate Jesus in front of a lot of people to make it very, very clear he is not honored. To make it very clear that while he's been invited, he's been invited not to be warmly welcomed. He's been invited to be shamed in front of all these people. You having an aha moment yet? I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that where you realize, you know what? I'm here, but there's a whole lot of signals telling me I'm not welcome here. I never really put it, to, never really put it together that... Jesus would know what that feeling was. 
when Jen and I were in seminary. I went to class. She put me through. We worked at the Bluegrass Boys Ranch, middle school boys. Hmm. Educational program. And the Bluegrass Boys Ranch was funded by a lady who um, owned, I can't remember how many it was, uh, Kentucky Derby winners. She was a woman of means. And she would have the annual derby party. And I can't remember, this was more than five years ago. Uh, But she would have the derby party, which at the time was $250 a plate to attend. And always on the radio, these are the celebrities that are going to be flying in for the derby and they're going to be attending the Madden Derby Party. Not John Madden, but... But you know what? By virtue of working at the boys' ranch, we got free invites to the Derby Party. And so we got to go to the Derby Party and we could rub shoulders or elbows or whatever you were supposed to rub with celebrities from all over the place and the, the elites there in the Lexington area. And it was really quite the to-do. So we get this invitation and there's some teaching staff. There's Jen and me and there's some others. And we all huddled together because like, okay, this is a big do. This is like news. This is the focus in Lexington about the big derby weekend party. And we all went together and we put our heads together to say, well, who has... The- who has the fanciest or at least the best looking vehicle that we could all ride in <laughs> to see so that kind of jetted me out and someone had a blazer a chevy blazer and so it was like that's the best we got so we all piled in there's like eight of us piling into this blazer and then it was you know the whole valet parking and everything like that and so you're seeing you know the porsches and the lexus and then here we are in a blazer <laughs> so, but we made it and we went in and it took us about took me about Less than eight minutes to figure out I didn't belong here. To realize that while we were invited, we weren't really welcome. And the other part that I realized is that frankly I didn't want to be there. And here's why. Because I realized that there were some folks that were dignitaries that were drunk out of their mind and embarrassing themselves. And no one really... Yeah. And there are others that you realize that just declarative sentences were passing as wit. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of warm out today. Ha, 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 ha. Like, that's funny. I don't know. But I realized every signal in that whole deal was saying, you don't really belong here. You're not particularly welcome here, even though you've received an invite. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of an experience or not. But here's what I know. Jesus had it. That's a situation. It's set up to dishonor him. And to do so publicly. And as you read on, you see why. Or you at least see that that comes true in vivid colors. But there's a problem with the setup. It's a setup situation. But you know what the problem is? Jesus is the unwelcome guest. But everything gets blown up by the uninvited guest. Right? There's the uninvited guest that shows up. And she sees this is what's not being done with Jesus. The most basic kinds of things to show hospitality and kindness. And she says, I'm doing it. But she doesn't just do it. She does it all out. You know what Mel was talking about? About breaking breaking the vial or breaking breaking the, 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 the perfume jar. She goes all out. So instead of just saying, okay, yes, I'll give you a token kiss on the hand to show that you're one. No, she kisses his feet. And rather than just say, okay, here's some water to wash your feet, she washes his feet with her tears and wipes with her hair. And it isn't just here's some oil to kind of say, here's the perfume, the costly perfume. She goes all out in showing not just the hospitality, but the honor to Jesus that the host, Simon, isn't showing at all. Now, isn't that an interesting situation? And it's also what prompts the parable that Jesus tells. By the way, did you take note of Simon's response when the woman does this? He's a little bit scandalized 
And I think it just, in his own mind, he's justifying himself, right? See, this person is no prophet. He's not worthy of honor because he's letting this woman do these things. Hmm. A glimpse into his heart. That's the situation. It goes into the parable. Here's Christianity illustrated, and Jesus tells the parable. Remember it? There's a money lender, and there are two debtors, and one owes 50, and one owes 500, and they are not able to pay, and so the money lender forgives them. Can I unpack that just a little bit? Let's break this down. Number one, there is a money lender. There is a money lender, and he is owed right this is an extortion he's not trying to take from people what what is not you know what's rightfully theirs it doesn't even say that he's pressing to collect the debt he just says there's a debtor and there is the money lender there is a money lender and he is owed and here's why it's the basic idea there is a god and if there is a god he is the one who gives the moral law correct let me frame this for you another way real quick If you have any concept of right and wrong, any concept of good or evil, you are saying there is a God. Because if there is no God, all you have left is just opinions. But the minute we see that there is a right and wrong, we see that there is a moral lawgiver, and that's God, and he is owed. And there is no one in that parable who doesn't owe. Correct? There is a money letter. He is owed. And... Both are indebted to him. And both, or let me put it the other way, neither has enough resource to pay. Right? That's what the parable says. There's a money lender, and he is owed. And there are those who are in his debt, and none of them have enough to pay. So what happens from here? Whenever there's a debt, one of two things has to happen. Either it gets paid, or the debt gets canceled. And in this parable, when faced with their inability and helplessness to pay what they owe, the money lender, it says, is gracious. And he forgives the debt. That's my story. And that's your story. That's our story. That's anyone who's ever come to God. That's their story. There is a money lender and he is owed. And I am in his debt and I do not have the means to repay. And in the face of my, in the face of my need and inability to repay, he's gracious. And he forgives. That's the parable. And then comes the question. And the question is, there's one who's forgiven greatly and one who's forgiven even more greatly. Who do you think is going to love more? Meaning, the love we show reflects our awareness of how deeply we've been forgiven. That's the point. Did you get it? The love we show to Jesus reflects our awareness or our appreciation of how deeply we've been forgiven. But in case there's any question, Jesus then explains the parable. And he does it by fancy comparison and then by contrast. No, he does do it the other way. He does it by contrast and then by comparison. There you go. Now listen. It's this alternating contrast, right? I came to your house. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman did. You didn't give me water for my feet, but this woman washed my feet. You didn't give me oil. She gave me perfume. And then 
he draw he connects the dots this woman loved greatly why she was forgiven greatly and Jesus doesn't take that comparison to the next step he just lets it hang there for Simon to figure it out it's a very interesting parable gives a glimpse into Jesus life gives us a glimpse into the meaning of a parable and I'm going to put it this way the depth of our appreciating how we've been forgiven shows not just can you hear me uh oh you alright okay the depth of our understanding of forgiveness shows not just in our love for Jesus but I believe it also shows in the way we look at other people Here's some takeaway points from the parable. Number one, if you're taking notes, you want to write these down because they are pretty good. I just made them up, but they are true. Here's the first one. There's two ways, according to this story, at least two ways that you can wind up separated from God. Here's one, by your sin, and here's the other, by your righteousness. Our sin tends to be a little bit more obvious and a little more outward, right? Those who kind of say, I'm just going to go and do what I want to do. That's a way to find up separated from God. Here's another one. Your righteousness, which is not so obvious. It's far more insidious. It's also inward and it is lethal. When we begin to think that we are righteous somehow because of our good behavior and because of our own goodness, that sets us up for some really bad stuff that goes on inside. And that's what you see in Simon versus the woman who's the sinner. And he thinks he's this close to God and he thinks she's a million miles away from God when the reality is probably just the other way. She's very close to God. And Jesus says at the end, she is forgiven and her faith, her response to God is what made everything different. And he is a million miles away. There are two ways, two ways to be separated from God. Second, our righteousness, I believe, is a more lethal way of being separated from God. (laughs) Yeah. Because when we buy into that, we don't see that we need to be forgiven. When we buy into our own goodness and righteousness, we don't see how much we need to be forgiven. Next takeaway point. To know you're deeply forgiven shows To know you're deeply forgiven shows. To know that you're greatly forgiven shows in the way you love Jesus and the way you look at other people. And if we're pretty casual about Jesus, then we are showing that we don't really know how greatly we've been forgiven and at what cost our forgiveness has come. And I'm going to add to that, when we look at other people and place ourselves as superior, we are reflecting that we really don't know how deeply we've been forgiven. Agreed? Here's the last. One of the best reminders that I know of how deeply we've been forgiven is communion. To receive the body and the blood of Jesus to understand that's what it cost for us to be set free for us to be forgiven that's a powerful reminder of how greatly we've been forgiven